Uh, hi, my name is Jay, and I'm the co-founder of Orangutan Gaming. Hi, everyone. My name is Laura Cornelia Namedinova, and I run a marketing agency, Alkai Consulting. We've been in the space since 2016, and we help gamify, DeFi, Layer 1, NFT projects to reach their audiences. Uh, hi, I'm Rohit Jagasya. Uh, I'm the founder and CEO of Revenant Esports, and we are a professional esports team. Hi everyone, I'm Bharat Patel, the chairman and founder of uh, UD Solutions Limited. We are a game development company, and of course with a lot of blockchain and other stuff as well. Thank you. Uh, so Laura, my first question would be directed towards you. So how are you like helping you know, market gaming companies all over the world? That's a very good question. So when we think about marketing a gamify project, we first need to understand who is their target audience and what kind of gamers are they targeting. Are these a young generation Gen Zs or are these millennials, maybe older generation? And based on that, who is your target audience? Then you reverse engineer what are the best channels to reach them. Are this is building a gamers guild, going through Discord, or for example, maybe even running Facebook ads, you need to understand how, what is the most effective way to reach your target audience? And then what do they wanna hear? Why would they play your game? Is it a play to earn and their incentive is to make money? Is it a game focused on engagement, on collaborating, building a community, and then maybe the focus is those uh, gamers who want to build a community. So we need to understand who is the target audience, how do you want to reach it, and what kind of messages you want to basically implement. And that's what we do as an agency. We combine all of this in a strategy and then execute in the most effective way. Uh, so Rohit, uh, how has the gaming space evolved over time, and how do you think the Web3 is sort of having an impact on the gaming sector? So I think uh, esports and gaming all together has a very strong community, and uh, we 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 as uh, we we at Revenant have tied up with a, a Web3 guild called Indie GG. Manish was just here, and uh, we actually what we do do for them is uh, we are sort of an en enabler for them, where where we actually get them audiences who follow our gamers and all of that. I think. We are still into the whole competitive space of things where we participate in games like Valorant and you know, uh, Battlegrounds Mobile India and a couple of other games. But Web3, from an esports point of view, is still to, I think, you know, come to the, like, you know, it's still, it, it still has to grow in India. And not only in India, you know, in, I think, uh, throughout the world, because I think uh, the audiences that actually play competitive gaming, they still have to be educated about MetaMask and, you know, most of the wallets and how to link them and how to use them. But for now, I think for esports teams and uh, content creators who are a part of the whole esports ecosystem, they are more like an enabler for Web3. And I think that shift will come soon. Uh, Bharat, sir, so what are the newer gaming avenues like, uh, like that are sort of coming up apart from Gamify and Engaged One? Uh, you mean about the... Uh, like the newer gaming avenues that are sort of coming up now? Well, I'll tell you that um, as what Manish was just saying about uh, the new gaming arena that's going to be there, I think uh, the whole shift is uh, becoming uh, centric to the gamers. And uh, more so because uh, now it is going to become a kind of a profession, I would say. So when we talk about uh, Web3 based uh, gaming, you know, involving security is one of the major tasks which people are going to look forward to. And of course, the government regulatories, which are going to be very important. I think the games, uh, the earlier speaker, I think she mentioned about uh, the story, which is the most important part. Because the engagement of a gamer would be only there when the story is right. Otherwise, I think uh, the people would play for some time and maybe, you know, after some time, they're going to leave it. So uh, I think the games would be more centric to the gamers. And that's what we, you know, we're going to see in the over period of time. And of course, technology is going to take a newer leap into it, especially with uh, cloud gaming and all that. That's going to be much more um, you know, important because the devices that we currently have may not be that good at the moment to have a very engaging experience. But when the cloud and with the 6G coming in, I think it's going to be a newer experience. Uh Jay, so what is so lucrative about the gaming space that traditional gaming companies like EA, Ubisoft, Big Games have already started to make moves in the sector? 
So I think, um, you know, the lucrative part for uh, Web3 and like the link between uh, gaming, uh, the gaming 2.0 and Web3 would be the community because I think uh, the community that the Web3 uh, games are also going to cater is a very similar community. So uh, there is not going to be a different community that's going to be formed for this. So as you know, in the previous panels also, as they mentioned, the quality of games have to kind of improve. And uh, it is improving, uh, as Rohit also uh, mentioned, we've partnered with IndieGG uh, to help them be the enablers to kind of uh, build a community for them. Uh, I think what's great about Web3 and what's going to be lucrative uh, is the play to earn model. Uh, as in when, uh, you know, the gamers can stick to a particular game or become loyal to a particular game. Um, you know, the trading of the skins and different, different things that Web3 can enable, which currently, like today we call them in-game assets, but we don't treat them as, as assets. You can't, uh, uh, you know, transfer a skin that I own to someone else. So I think Web3 is going to be that, uh, uh, you know, I think enabler and something that will um, help uh, boost the whole uh, ecosystem altogether. Coming to you, Laura. Uh, so how are you get? Uh, yeah, how are you helping the gaming companies get funds? How are you helping the gaming companies get funds? Yeah, it's for you. So the question was about fundraising, basically. So one thing uh, I can share, what I think is going to be the best learning experience for everyone. By the way, how many of you are here who are actually like building a gaming product? Who raise your hands? Who is building a gaming product? One, two, only a few people. Who wants to build a gaming product? That's why they're there. Okay, we have a few more. So basically, everyone, no matter if it's a gaming or any kind of DeFi product or whatever, every founder is focusing to make the best product ever. They spend countless hours with developers, with product people, to make it the best graphics, the best skins, everything, whatever you think about. But they forget to build a community. And investors care more about the traction than about to make it a perfect game. So I would encourage everyone first, build an MVP and have the community, have the people in the mailing list, waiting list, maybe those who are playing your early beta, just waiting for your game and that will increase your chance of getting the funding rather than focusing on just the game. Because if you can choose the perfect game with zero community or mediocre game, but with 10,000 people just begging for it to be launched, well, everyone can guess what's going to be chosen. So that's number one, what's very important. Number two is understanding for investors, and we have some investors here in the audience who probably will agree with me, it's all about of making the return. So the question is, how will your game, will it be a token investment or will it be an equity investment, will make that money? Will it be a token, then what kind of to tokenomics? Why would a person keep the token? Because basically you want the people, as many people as possible to keep the token. So why would people keep the token? So think about these things of how will you help the investors bottom line to show not 2x return, but 10x return. So if you have a big community and you have a very clear, tangible strategy, how are you going to build those 10x for the investors? These are basically two key things you, you will need in order to have a successful fundraising campaign. These two things, that's it, you're good. And us as a marketing agency, we help companies with one of these things is to build a community. So even if you don't have the community yet, you don't have the product yet, you come to us, we help you to do that. So then when you're going to investors, like, hey, our game already has a need. There is 10,000, 20,000 people in the waiting list waiting for me just to secure X amount of money and then we can launch. Uh, so my next question is directed to Bharat sir. Uh, so, Indian epics are being adopted as sort of new game content, so what are your thoughts about that? Well, uh, I'm, I'm glad that you're asking something like this because uh, even our Honorable Prime Minister has been uh, reiterating about the Indian ethos and specifically looking to the mythology that we have, which is pretty rich. How do we create characters and design the storyline based on those uh, Indian ethos? I think uh, there are a couple of characters which are casual games or hyper casual games which have already been in the market. But I think uh, over a period of time, you will see more and more of such kind of studios coming up specifically for the Indian uh, mythological and character making, you know. 
I think the storyline is there which we have. It's all about how to engage people, especially the younger generation. So I think that's, that's where uh, the bridge between uh, the characters which are already there and the newer generation is what we need to bridge to. And I think that's going to happen very soon. Uh, so Rohit, uh, the number of gamers have increased in the post-COVID area. So what has acted as the catalyst in the sector? So, I mean, a lot of people were at home and they didn't have too much to do. So, you know, COVID was a big factor, but I think it was not only COVID. I think uh, with Geo coming in with the cheapest mobile data plans in the country, that also acted like a really big catalyst for people actually downloading a game on their phone and, you know, uh, aspiring to become a, become a competitive player or, you know, uh, or, you know, engage with your friends to, you know, just entertain themselves. And apart from that, I mean, during COVID, India also became the second largest smartphone market in the world. So the accessibility to, uh, towards smartphones and to games became, became, became really easy. And apart from that, uh, I think most parents uh, don't really let their children watch a lot of content on OTT. And I mean, a better way for them to, you know, get entertained is to watch a YouTube stream to, you know, see if, see one of their favorite teams or, you know, one of their favorite players or streamers, you know, creating content around the game that they play. So I think it was, COVID was definitely a really big factor, but I think the other factors also did play a very important role in, you know, in the whole sort of competitive ecosystem and esports and gaming in general. So, uh, since we're running short on time, so my last question is directed towards Laura. So, can you share some of some some insights of the gaming community, Laura? Laura, can you repeat the question? Can you share some of the insights of of the gaming community? Okay, so some of the insights for the gaming community. So, first thing, what I would definitely love everyone who is here in the audience to kind of take away is, gaming has enormous potential if you do it right and not go it because, hey, it's sexy, all the investors are pouring money, everyone wants to build a game, because you actually have some kind of good idea. And in some cases, when clients come to us from the gaming world, and they're like, hey, we're building this thing, help us to get started, we're like, do you really want to build another game where our 10 same ones, very similar ones, join another game? So don't build a game just because you want to be a gamer. Build a game where you actually see the value and the community you're going to have. That's one insight. Insight number two, you don't always need blockchain or Web3 to build a game. A lot of gamers and a lot of gaming projects use Web3 or blockchain or a token just because it's a buzzword. And during the last bull run, you can just raise money and investors were pouring money into it. We're just having a regular, not token, could be just in uh, game cash or whatever, works very well. The same thing with NFTs and skins. Yes, this is sexy, everyone's talking about, you mentioned about it, but the adoption is not there yet. Until we're going to find a way how we can exchange those in-game assets across all the different games, this is going to be just a nice idea, just a nice marketing pitch. So you always need to think, are you building something and spending your time, resources, because it's actually needed by the community, by actually needed by your gamers, or is it because it's a sexy, trendy word and others are doing, so you're doing it as well. So think about it. Sometimes doing small and simple is better than doing big and slashy, just having a buzzword. So I would say these are the three key takeaways I would love everyone in the audience to take home. Uh, so we're done with the panel. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you guys and thank you all for attending.